There we go. Hello, everybody. I was just talking with mute on. So, uh, ask everybody to raise their hands if they can hear me. Please uh, hit the raise your hand button if you can. And we'll get going if I get some raised hands. Sweet. Got some raised hands going on. All right. So today we're going to uh, talk about something uh, called Kanban. And if you're not familiar with Kanban, oops, if you're not familiar with Kanban, I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction to it. Um, really can't do a complete introduction to it, but it'll be a, a briefish introduction, so you'll get the, the gist of what's going on, and we'll talk about uh, three of the most common problems that we find when we're doing implementations with folks of Kanban. Uh, again, if you have questions, please just type them into the, the questions box there, and I will try and answer them as we go along. On my screen, the, the questions are over here on the side, so over here. You can't see them, but they're there. And uh, we'll get going. All right. So let's click. I want to make sure I'm recording because I wanted to make sure. Yes, I am recording. So if anyone can't attend today, we'll uh, make sure that they can hear the recording. OK. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, what is Kanban. And that kind of covers the Kanban done right part of it. Um, then we'll talk about three common problems. One is missing steps in the map. And you'll know what that means when we're done with the intro. Um, two is not defining the whip. And three is that your stories are too big, which is a common problem in almost every actual practice. But we'll talk about it, how that affects uh, Kanban as we go through here today. All right. So what is Kanban? Um, if you could, let's see, I'm going to lower everybody's hands here. We'll lower them all. And if you, if you could, please raise your hand if you uh, have heard of or are familiar with Kanban. I'm just taking a little straw poll here to find out what people know about Kanban. A couple of people that do, a couple of people that don't. OK, so that's good. That's good. People uh, need to know what this is. Kanban actually is one of the most popular ways of implementing Agile in the market today. Um, Scrum really out of the gate was the the big the big push that everybody uh, went to for implementing Agile. Um, folks are finding over time now that that uh, it works great. Scrum is fantastic. Uh, I, I really really like Scrum if you can do it. Um, but Scrum takes a little bit of work. You have to be sure that you have a dedicated team that is truly cross functional. You have to make sure that you have a dedicated product owner who's really going to be available. You have to be able to estimate how much work you're going to get done within an iteration um, accurately and complete uh, all of the work in that iteration, the testing, the development, the UI, everything. It's got to be done within your one iteration time frame <clears throat> to make uh, Scrum actually, actually, actually work. Um, you can do it without those things, but you're doing what they call Scrum Butt, which is you know kind of a halfway done Scrum. Uh, Kanban, on the other hand, is an approach that is evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary. Right? When you, if you've implemented Scrum in your organization, or if you've read about implementing Scrum, you've read that people just you have to jump in with both feet and do the whole thing, right? Um, Kanban is one that says, you know what? It's really disruptive to my organization to try and do something like that. But I still want to get some benefits that we are seeing in Agile. So how can we step into it and not have uh, this huge explosion of change in our organization? Let's have little mini pops of change instead of a giant explosion of change. So what is Kanban? Well, Kanban comes from uh, the lean manufacturing movement, the concept comes from there. And originally, it's what you see here on the right. Um, that's why we have a little manufacturing picture going on here. So say you're this, this uh, purple-clad worker, and you are attaching these knobs to these little television sets, it looks like. And you have a box full of knobs to your, to your right, and you're taking a, a knob out and you're putting it on, and you're taking a knob out, and you're putting it on. And as you go through, 
your box of knobs gets lower and lower and lower. At some point, you will run into a little Kanban card. And it is this little, literally a little card like this that's in your pile of, of parts down towards the bottom. And when you get that, you send it back up the line to the area of the manufacturing plant that supplies those knobs, right? And the time, the reason it's down towards the bottom is that it takes some time to go up the line to have that order filled and come back. And so in an ideal world, it's set up so that based on your cadence, the speed at which you implement these knobs, the speed at which you put the knobs on the, on the, uh, the little televisions, the supply will have come back to you just when you run out. So you'll put the last knob on, and boom, here's the new pile of, of knobs ready for, you know, a new box of knobs ready for you to start putting them on. No delay, also no waste, right? There's no inventory sitting there waiting for you to get to it. It's, it's resupplied immediately. That's the idea of Kanban. What you're doing is, by, by doing that, you're, you are pulling the inventory from the inventory supplier rather than a traditional approach, which is that the, the knob supplier would be um, trying to guess when you needed more knobs and pushing them out, right, and shoving more supply into the, the field. Well, if you had uh, had to you know, slow down for some reason or weren't keeping up the same pace, then what they're going to do is they're going to push too much inventory out there, and you're going to be buried in knobs. Or maybe you're working faster, and there you run out of knobs, and then you wind up sitting there waiting for more knobs. So this is a just-in-time tool, uh, the Kanban card. And that actually, Kanban actually means a signal card or, or um, poster card or big sign card. Um, in this little signal card right there is exactly what it is. So that's the, the history of Kanban and where it comes from. How we use it in software development or in, in uh, agile kinds of projects is we set up uh, a system that uses a similar kind of card and flow system. Um, and it'll look kind of familiar to you if you've done Scrum before because Scrum has sort of a similar board, but there's some missing elements that make it not a Kanban board. So let's take a look at what a Kanban board looks like. Um, oh, oh, that's right. I wanted to go through this process first. So um, the way you start doing Kanban uh, is to go through this lean process, right? Anytime you, you start uh, a lean project or, or working with lean, you, you want to go through these five steps. And I didn't make these up. These come from lean.org, which is the mothership of everything lean. Um, so if you look, you, you first want to identify value. So I've got a project uh, or, or a, a system, and I want to identify what is the value I'm trying to deliver to my customer. In the case of a, a software development organization, which is frequently what we deal with, um, though it doesn't have to be that. It could be any kind of creation. Um, software development, you have working software, right? Wor working software features delivered to the customer is what value is. And then you would map the value stream. What's a value stream? A value stream is the steps along the way to the customer that where value is created along the line. So uh, a customer makes a request for a feature, and then from that request all the way through to the delivery of that feature to the customer is the value stream. Now, there may be steps in there that are non-value added steps. So to the customer, they don't add value, right? So maybe something like um, transportation or, or writing of a software spec or things like that, um, maybe code reviews to the customer, and, and I you could probably debate code reviews, but think about it. The customer, they don't really care if you do a code review. They just want to make sure that the software is working right, right? They don't care if you have to wait 
for your VP to get approval to, of this specification to move on to the next step. The customer just wants to get their software. Okay? So there's value add VA and non value add NVA um, things within that value stream. And so the idea is to look at that value stream, measure the steps along that value stream, and determine well, first thing to figure out is where is there wasted time, wasted effort, stuff that we didn't realize we were doing that really is wasting time along the process, and hey, we can get rid of those right away. Um, then there's other things that are not value added, but based on the systems that we currently have, we have to keep them. Um, for example, you may have you may have a lot you may spend a lot of time in testing, right? So let's let's just throw out. I'm going to go down here. Here's a here's a value stream example, right? So there's some requirements definition, there's some design, there's some building, and there's some testing. This this isn't really this is like a sample. Um, you actually would have more columns than this, but it's a, a a sample for you. And maybe you have a lot of time spent in the testing phase um, because you're doing manual testing, right? You have to manually test and retest and retest every time there's a, a change to the system. Well, that manual testing is a type of waste because you could automate all that and make it much more efficient and, and much more quickly uh, processed. So that is a type of waste, um, but it's not an immediately removable waste, right? If there was a, uh, a two-week delay between the time the requirements were finished and the time people started working on it because of some random reason, you know, that people weren't ready for it because they didn't know it was coming, you could remove that kind of waste by saying, okay, we're going to pre-warn them that it's coming, and then they can get going. There's a waste removal easily done. So that's type 1 MUDA. MUDA is Japanese for waste. Um, so that, that waste removal is, uh, is easy. Type 1 MUDA removal is relatively easy compared to that type 2, which is, you know what? With our current systems, we can't get rid of this problem. Does that make sense? I know I'm covering some stuff really, really fast with Kanban, but um, it's important you understand this in order to understand the, the next part of it. So what, what you're doing right now is you're just mapping out, hey, how do we currently do stuff? Now, in, in most of the projects I've done you know, in my career as a traditional and an Agile project manager, as a traditional project manager, I, I never did this. And I, I think it was crazy not to, um, because there are some standard steps that you go through in anything. And to just map it out like this allows you to see just visually where are you in the process? Are we, are we in requirements still? Are we moving things into design? Where are we? Um, so let's talk about what's, what's on this little chart. This is a, a kind of a typical looking Kanban ch chart. Um, you have the backlog of work here. You can call this your requirements backlog, your requirements specification backlog, something like that. Um, and then what happens is, is you keep this prioritized and you'll move things one at a time into, or a couple at a time, into this MMF. So MMF stands for minimally marketable feature. And that's what you want to be developing, is a minimally marketable feature, right? So each one of these purple cards is hopefully an, an MMF, minimally marketable feature. And that breaks down into several different stories that are going to make it up. And the stories in Kanban are what flow. Now, I'll pause because that's different. That's different than what you do in Scrum. If you're familiar with Scrum, you know that you at the beginning of the sprint, you pull a story in to the sprint, and then you task it out, right? Well, this is different. Kanban does not use iterations. It uses a flow. And so you pull a, an MMF, a minimally marketable feature, into this starting column, and you break that down into some the stories that make it up. So minimally marketable features are probably bigger than, than your typical Scrum story. They don't have to be, though, so don't get that wrong. 
um, you may may wind up with an MMF that is itself just one story, and you, you flow that through. And, and the reason that you don't break it down into tasks is look at these columns. These columns are what your tasks would be, right? You, you have some part of, of requirements definition, some parts of design, some something in build, and something in, in testing, and then you're done. So instead of, and you couldn't flow a task through that. It doesn't make sense. How would I flow the testing task through? Doesn't make any sense. So what you do is you have the, the stories, and you flow the stories through in process to done, in process to done. And remember how how the uh, the Kanban card was was sent back so that they're pulling inventory in? Well, this is the same thing that happens here. The design people sit here and wait until something moves from the requirements group into the done column, and then they pull it. And then the, the requirements people are able to finish one and move it over here into the done again, and they pull one from here. So it, looks, it may look like it's pushing this direction, but really what's happening is it's all pulling from the back end. It's all pulling from the customer end. I know this is a lot of information for you, and, and I apologize for trying to explain Kanban in 15 minutes, but hopefully most of you understand. Some of, some of you understand what it is. If not, you know, um, I have classes, <laughs> and I teach this in, in the classes. Uh, we do several exercises with Kanban, and, and uh, we talk a lot about how it works and making it work, because it's actually one of the better ways to implement Agile. So you're pulling these tasks, or I mean these stories, sorry, from from column to column down the line. And then you have up here on the top are the, the, the different phases or, or you know, column, the process groups that you're going through, work groups that you're going through. And these will be different for every organization, right? Not for every project, hopefully, uh, though it may change, but uh, they'll be different for every organization. And what we have here, this little number, is the WIP number. What is WIP? WIP stands for Work in Progress. So Work in Progress. So this one here, in the requirements, we've limited our, our Work in Progress to two, which means there may be, maybe there, it looks like probably one person in this group, right, in the requirements that's writing the requirements. So they can only have two things in progress at any given time, meaning they can only have one thing either two things in progress, two things in done, or one in each. But you can't have three cards in this little section here. And that's a self-imposed criteria, right? So to begin with, you set the numbers kind of high. And as you see bottlenecks start to form, then you start to lower that number down in the bottleneck areas to try and throttle the whole organization to work at the speed of the bottleneck. And that gets into the whole theory of constraints. but. Um, Read Eliyahu Goldratt's book, The Goal, The Goal, and uh, that, that gives a lot of information about the theory of constraints. It's where it comes from. So here, this person has, has two pieces of work that they're limited to. Um, only when the design people pull one in can these guys now pull another card in. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So you've got this requirements person, and if they move this one over here to done, they, they're waiting. They're stopped. Because as an organization, we have self-imposed this rule that says only two pieces of work in progress at any time. And there's lots of good reasons for that that we don't have time to get into. But trust me, <laughs> it's important. Um, again, if you come to the class, we, we can go over why that works. But that's it. That, so that's what we do. Um, I want to go back up one screen here. So we've mapped the value stream, and we're working to create flow. So you see how we're, we're flowing things down this direction? Um, you want to make these cards be smallish so that they can flow. If they're big, they're not flowing. They're waterfall, right? And then we've established that pull. You see how I talked about that already? You're pulling the cards down. And you want to seek perfection. So you want to um, do your, your retrospectives. Now, we don't have iterations in Kanban, right? There's no iteration there. It's just constantly flowing work. 
So we have to set up our own timeline, maybe once a month, maybe once every three weeks or something like that, but set up a, a regularly scheduled time to do a, a retrospective, to think about, okay, how can we improve this? And, uh, you know, in, in that whole concept actually comes from lean, right? The, the Japanese word kaizen, I mean, that's the, the, the continually improving organization is a kaizen organization. So you want to set your time periods to, to seek perfection. And by seeking perfection, what you do is you go back through and you go, okay, is, is, is that value that we identified still true? Is that still the value that our customers need? Is our map truly accurate? Is it really reflecting what, what we do in normal work, right? Do we have good flow? Is our poll working? So you kind of go through that whole process again, and then you seek perfection again. And it's a continual um, process of growth. Okay, all of that to start talking about now, if you've implemented Kanban in your organization, what are some of the things that might go wrong with it? And there's three big, big things that might go wrong. First is missing a step in the map. This is really easy to miss a step in the map. It's very easy because um, we often make assumptions, right? Or, or, I mean, we just, sometimes we'll just miss it. Sorry, the first one is that we just missed it. Flat out, we mapped out the flow and didn't even think about the fact that we had to do a code review before we completed this work, before we said it was done in development. You know, I just, it slipped my mind. Yeah, it happens. Don't, don't fret about it. And none of these things in this are really you know, to have a heart attack about. It's just, it's all a learning process and growing your, your efficiency and getting better, right? That's the whole thing about, about using this Kanban approach is it really makes it very clear when you got it and when you don't, right? As soon as, as, soon as you, you're missing something, it shows itself, right? So if you've missed a step, Maybe it's because you, you made some assumptions, right? Sometimes people think, oh, that's not important. You know, I just need to get sign off for my boss. And he usually does that the same day I give it to him. I mean, I just walk into his office and I get his sign off and it's, it's always only just two minutes. So I'm not going to put that down as a, a process step. Pardon me while I take a drink. Um, but those things are important because what happens if your boss is on vacation? and you needed that approval. Uh, and they forgot to put somebody in charge to get that. Uh, see, then you don't see it if you don't have a step for it in the system. So don't think something's not important. Put everything down. It's easier to put it all out there and collapse things down than it is to have too few columns and try and build them back up once you've already started. So put too much down to begin with. Uh, the next, the next idea, you know, you would assume that everyone knows that you have to do. Well, of course, everybody knows we have to do a code review. I don't need to put that down. Yeah, you do. Um, you thinking, think that something's never a problem, or that that doesn't take long, like signatures. So, um, the other thing is, oftentimes when we're first putting Kanban in, if you're anything like me, you like to fix problems, and when you are putting Kanban in, you will see things that you go, oh, that, of course I can get rid of that. That's, you know, that's a no-brainer. Let's just get rid of it. Let's just fix it right now. Don't try and fix it right now, right? Put it down. Write it down that it's there. That's the current state. You're going to change it over time, but start where you are and don't try and say that it's any different than it is because trying to fix it before you get going is just going to cause you trouble. I mean, you're going to miss it, and somebody is going to assume you had to do it or something. So put down what you currently really, really do. Really do. All the steps. Okay. Each one of those steps is a column with an in progress and done, in progress and done. Okay. All right. What does it look like? Well, it'll, it'll often look like something stuck in progress, right? Something stuck, I wrote process, process progress. It's something stuck in progress and not moving forward. It's really not stuck in progress. 
it's just waiting for approval, or it's waiting for testing to complete, or it's waiting for something that should be a column, but you missed putting the column in there. <laughs> right? You're doing two things in that column, and you didn't have them both there. Um, what will sometimes show up is you'll find at your, your daily stand-up, and yes, in Kanban we do daily stand-ups. Um, typically, we don't go through the same three questions. What we do is look at the Kanban board and say to ourselves, okay, what has not moved? Oh, that story didn't move. Okay, Janet, why didn't that story move? Paul, why didn't that story move? Then that's all we ask. You can have a group of, of 50 developers working on a Kanban project because, again, it's just mapping what you currently do. Right? We're not trying to break you down into scrum teams and make sure everyone's cross-functional. No, this works in totally siloed kinds of organizations. Helps to break down the silos, though. Uh, but lets you keep your current operating system, current, current functioning way of working. Um, but, so you can have really large groups. You don't ask as many questions. So you just look at the board. There's our problem. Move forward. But what happens is oftentimes things will will stagnate, right? It's stuck in, in this particular step, and you need an explanation. Oftentimes, that person is done with their work, and they're waiting for something else. And so they start to get defensive about, well, it's not, I'm, I'm not stuck. It's not waiting. I just need this. So you'll get a defensive um, sense from people when they're in that position. And as project leaders, you need to be careful. Um, that you're not feeding people and making them feel defensive. You know, make sure that it's an open and caring uh, meeting, an open and caring organization, and saying, hey, that's, that's cool. We just want to make sure we get, get this right. If there's something else that's happening in this column, let's break it out and make another column for it. Oh, that's awesome. You've just helped us understand our organization better. Um, actually, we, we often call this revealing the system to itself. Right? There's a system out there that's working, and people don't know what all the flow is within that system. And you're revealing that system to itself, to the people who work in it. So what are some cures to that? Well, there's you know, two approaches. You can either avoid the problem or fix the problem. To avoid the problem, the great thing to do is to define exit criteria for each column. You know, don't go crazy. Right? Don't make it all really, really difficult. But if you define those exit criteria for each column, then you'll often find things like those signatures, or that testing needs to be done, or that something. Some, something else needs to happen b before you can say that is done. Right? So define those exit criteria. And have the culture of, uh, of honesty, right? so that people feel safe in telling you about something that's different. Again, also for fixing it, that open and honest organizational culture will help you grow and understand the systems that you work in every day. Uh, another, trying to fix the problem, another question is, is the five whys. Another way to do it is using the five whys technique. Now, this is a complicated uh, lean technique, the five whys technique. So I'm going to try and explain it to you. Ask why. OK, that's it. <laughs> the, the five whys technique really is it's not complicated at all. You, you find a problem. There's a problem here. And you say, huh, so Bob, why is this stuck there? Well, because I need this. Oh, well, why do you need that? Well, because it's not done until the signatures are, are on it. Oh, well, why isn't it done? Uh, because my boss needs to know where things are that we're working on, and, and he needs to double check that um, we've done the documentation correctly. Oh, well, why does he need to double check that? Because he wants to make sure that it's all done and, and we've got the documentation correct. Oh, OK. So you've asked why several times. You don't really ask why five times. You ask it as many times as you need to get to the root cause of what's stopping something. And so you may, may in that particular one that I just made up off the top of my head, we may go, huh. Well, let's add another column that's called documentation because, you know, code documentation because we want to make sure that that part is done, right? So we're going to flow the story through the code documentation 
and then your boss can just look and it's made it through there and your approval will go much faster. Just a simple idea. Another uh, approach if, if you wind up with some really complicated reason that something's not happening is maybe do an Ishikawa, Ishikawa uh, the fishbone diagram, right, where you have different categories and I won't go into how to do an Ishikawa uh, analysis, but look it up online. You can figure out how to do a root cause analysis using Ishikawa. I like doing that. <clears throat> I also like using Ishikawa to uh, do risk definition, kind of a, what I call reverse Ishikawa. So you're, you're looking for possible risk areas in those different areas. But, so those are the possible ways to fix that. Um, let's talk about the second way Kanban can go wrong. The second way would be not defining WIP limits. So a WIP limit is that your, your limit on work in progress. This is what differentiates um, a scrum board and a Kanban board. One of the things that def differentiates a scrum board and a Kanban board. I mean, you, can, you can have a, uh, my kids use, use a Kanban board to do their chores every week. And if you go into my website on the very front page there, scroll down towards the bottom, um, I believe it's the middle video. There's three videos across down there. The middle video is a, a video of my kids and how they use Kanban to do their Saturday morning chores. But we have a three-column Kanban board, and it looks a lot like a scrum board, right? Because you have ready, doing, and done. Hmm, looks like scrum. The difference being we have identified WIP limits, and we don't have a time box. So they don't have a time box on, on getting their stuff in the well. Saturday, <laughs> but we don't, we don't put a time box on them beyond that. Um, and the WIP limit says, kids, you can only work on two, you know, one or two things at a time. Don't pull three or four things in. You'll just get overwhelmed. Work on one or two. It helps you focus. And it really is what makes Kanban work because you're, you're slowing down to the, the speed you can actually process your stuff. And we, we, we would call it inventory if we were doing manufacturing. We call it requirements or features when we're doing software. We call it chores or tasks in this case when we're doing Saturday morning chores, right? So we, we limit the number of things that you can have in progress at any given time so that the system creates that flow, right? That's the, the third one there. You define value, you map the system, establish flow, right? So that helps the system flow. And the other reason that you want to have, or, or the other thing is it's difficult to institute it later. That's my opinion. Um, other people would say to wait and yeah, yeah, I don't know. We might look at that, but let's let's take a look at it. What are the symptoms of this? Well, um, a lot of times, if if you aren't limiting your whip, then people are, are going to say, "Well, Kanban doesn't work," because what happens is, say, in the requirements area, often it'll happen in requirements and in testing. So, requirements area pulls in thirty-five features to develop requirements for. And they just get flailing because they have 35 things that they need to be you know, mentally shifting between. That's just too much for any one person to, to deal with. Even if you had three or four people, 35 is too many, right? Limit the number. It's the way we control bottlenecks. So um, maybe, it's, maybe it's in testing. And you've got your developers, and they're just developing, 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 and then they just dump a bunch of stuff on your testers. That is an uncontrolled bottleneck. So you've got now a ton of stuff that the testers are having to do, and they, they have, you know, there's this huge, huge pile in front of them, and they can't work their way through it fast enough to keep up with how fast it's coming in. And so they are now the bottleneck. People get frustrated. Developers are working their tails off to deliver features, but it's not getting tested. Okay, we'll skip testing. Ah, oh, how many times have you done that? Oh, we'll just cut testing. No. So that's, that's the idea of uncontrolled bottlenecks and the symptoms of, of if you 
don't have a whip limit, then it's not you don't have controls. Basically, a whip limit is your one of your biggest knobs in Kanban. So what do you do? Um, well, you set some initial whip limits. You have to make them up. Um, I tend to, when I'm working with an organization, I will say, let's set a whip limit of two or three per person. Okay, I'm a painter, and not like a house painter, but like a fine art painter. And I like to be working on two paintings at once because I'll be working on one painting and painting away. And then you kind of get to a point where you're like, Ugh, I don't know what to do now. It doesn't look right, but I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss as to how to fix it. So I'll turn back to, to the other painting I've been working on. And I'll work on that one for a little bit. And, after, and then I'll come to the same point with that one where you're like, oh, man, I'm just frustrated with this piece. And I'll look back to the first one that I was working on and go, oh, I've been away from it long enough. I have fresh eyes. I can see it with, with the new eyes and a new approach and go, oh, but now I see what to do. And I'll work on that first one again and go back to the other one when I get stuck on, on the first one back and forth like that. And having talked for years with developers, it's very similar with development, right? I'm not a software developer, um, except for like some HTML stuff. I, I do a little bit of that. And, you know, I do know how to do it, but I just don't do it uh, professionally. It was very similar to that need to go back and forth between paintings. You, you don't want to just work on one thing or you get you know, bored. And you don't want to work on too many things because you will get um, You'll, you'll waste a lot of time in context switching. And we've talked about before the 20% loss of context switching. So don't do that. So you want to set some, some whip limits initially, two, maybe three, and then throttle those up or down depending on where you start to find bottlenecks. Right. The other thing you can do is, and, and I put it on here, though I didn't recommend it in the first slide, um, is to wait. And don't put any whip limits in yet. And when bottlenecks start to appear, then put a put a whip limit on the where the bottleneck is. That's a it's a decent approach, I guess. Um, I haven't tried that one myself, and because I just think it's easier to start out with some whip limits. So if you have personal experience with with doing it without whip, whip limits first and then implementing them later, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but so my recommendation is to do it first with some estimated limits. But I didn't want to just give you my opinion. I want to give you a, a balanced view of what other people say as well. So that's how you cure the, the no whip limit problem. You use whip limits. <laughs> All right. Now to the stories question. Stories are too big. Common, common, common problem. I see it all the time, right? Your stories are too big. In, in Scrum, it happens, and it winds up. You wind up with carryover from sprint to sprint, right? Your story's too big. Um, in Kanban, what what it looks like is stalled stories, right? That the stories take four days, five days to move from uh, from column to column. Uh, you need to break down the stories so that they take one to two days max in each column. Right? The story should take about a week, week and a half, typically, to complete. And that means complete, like through all the columns. I've worked with organizations where I've said that before, where it should take a week to complete. And somebody in the organization has misinterpreted that to mean it should take a week per column, <laughs> which is not what I'm saying. I'm saying a total one week across the board. So. Um, Symptoms of this, this is the most common, right? So you'll see things moving at a snail's pace where stuff is stuck in one column for a long, long time, and then it goes bump into the next column, and then it waits in that column, and then bump into the next column. It looks like waterfall. It looks just like your traditional waterfall. You've got to get all this stuff done. Um, you have lots of people sitting around waiting for the next person to get their, their piece done. Um, oftentimes, when your stories are too big, 
they're actually not, uh, they're too big and dissimilar in size, which means they're not flowing either. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, one story will take 15 days, and another story will take five days, and another story will take 20 days to get done in each column. And I'm not kidding. I've seen this. Um, and because they're of such differing size, and they're so huge, the person finishes the one that takes 15 days, and they're still wait. They sit around for five more days waiting for the 15 for the for the 20 day one to get done, so they can pull it in. Or the person with the five day one has the 20 day one coming next, and you know they're done, but it's waiting in the the, the column prior to them to get done for the remaining 15 days. So they've got nothing to do. The problem with that is, of course, no one ever has nothing to do. So they get sucked onto another project. And people will say, oh, well, that's fine. We'll just have them work on another project. But the problem with that is then they're on that other project. And when the 15 or when the 20 day is done, they can't just go bang, I'm right back on it. They have to finish up what they're doing over there, wrap it up, hand it off, and then move back over here. And all of that takes time. Um, you'll find a lot of stressed people. Find people that are that are um, they, the people that are working on the stuff. You know that that's taking a long time, are frustrated because it's taking so long. The people who are waiting for it are frustrated because they want to be working on that next thing. Everyone's frustrated. The management's frustrated. Um, people wind up working overtime and working over weekends and holidays and things like that because they want to get this done. Look, it sounds so much like waterfall. So your stories are too big. Um, and often they are poorly written, meaning that it's, it's actually your, the story that you've got there is probably five stories. And the, it's, it's written in such a way that they're all intertwined. They don't follow the invest model. Um, where the I in invest stands for independent. Each story needs to be independent so that it can be worked on by itself and can be moved through the process independently of the rest of them. So that's what I, the, the invest model, look it up. Um, Bill Ward came up with the invest model a number of years ago, and everyone uses it these days to define what's a good story, uh, good story look like. Maybe I should just do a, a webinar on writing good story cards. Hmm, that might be nice. Let me know if you'd like to see that. All right, so those are the symptoms. What do you do? Uh, one of the best things you can do is story time. So I call it story time. And story time is where you, you take a, a block of time, probably an hour, in the morning, every day, or maybe one Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But I prefer to see it every day because then it's got a rhythm to it. Right, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, it kind of jars people because oh, today's a oh no, it's not, and um, people begin to resent the days that they have to go to it more if it's on an on and off basis. Where if it's a continued a half hour every day, people people just go oh, it's time for the it's time for story time, and what story time is is a time when you um, take a story that's in your backlog. And you discuss it as a team. So you have your, your product owner there. And yes, in Kanban, we have product owners, just like any other uh, approach. You still have to have somebody who's the owner of the product. For the product owner, maybe you have your BAs. You have people who understand what is required. And you have the whole team. Um, so you need to have everybody there. See that next bullet point, involve everyone. Because it may be that it's it's a you know, a one-day story or two-day story in each column except that one column where the person that represents it is not there, and then you're in trouble. <laughs> because that one person should be, you know, they, they, they'll they get it, and it takes them two weeks to get through it because whatever it is is very complicated from their perspective, right? The requirement may be really easy to write. The design from an architecture perspective is very simple. From a coding perspective, it's hard as nails. You just can't get through this. Or maybe even the coding is easy, but testing of it is really convoluted.
because we don't understand how something worked in it or something. So just trust me, get everyone there. Uh, another way to, to do it would be to get, an out, get some outside help. I've gone into organizations and helped them um, rip apart their stories and figure out better ways of creating a backlog, better ways of, of decomposing them so that they actually work in a, you know, in a flow like this. They have to be small enough to flow. That's the key, right? The, the one big, the, probably the biggest hurdle you'll have when implementing Kanban is not mapping it out. Uh, it's, it's not going to be setting your WIP limits. It's going to be this. It's going to be that things are so big because we're used to traditional projects. We're used to not having flow. We're used to doing everything in chunks, a big chunk, and then we hand that off. What we want to do is you want to break it down into smaller chunks and flow that work through the system. All right. We are at 1245, and I would like to open the phone lines to see if anyone has questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and uh, I will call upon you. the raised hands. Must have done a decent job of describing this. I'm not seeing a lot of questions right now. Oh, I have a question here. No immediate questions. Great. So, well, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Well, with that, I think uh, I'll let you know about the classes I have coming up if you are anywhere in the world. Um, I have classes coming up in, am I going to do a, one on developing stories? I, I got a question about doing a, a, a seminar on doing stories. Yeah, why don't I do that? Um, maybe I'll do that next. Should I do that next next month? Anybody that wants me to do that next month, raise your hand. Do you want a, a, a seminar on doing stories? Mm, yes. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, so if you happen to be in uh, Ireland or in San Diego, Madison, Wisconsin, New York, Phoenix, actually, if, you're, if you are in, in uh, Chicago, Phoenix, or Atlanta, I will see you next week because I am going to be in all three of those states next week. I'm, I am uh, I'm flying to Atlanta and speaking speaking there at the PMI chapter. And then I am off to Phoenix, where I'm speaking twice at their PMI chapters. And then I'm off to Chicago for a day of Agile, a big seminar that they're having there, or a conference that they're having there. And I'm speaking twice at that conference, once on the PMI ACP, and then again on the business value of Agile. So if you're in any of those cities, look me up. Come on over, and, and I'd love to, love to see you and chat with you at the, uh, at the event. Uh, I wanted to show everybody my website here, too, um, because I wanted to show you the Study Central. If you if you are interested in the PMI ACP, um, I have a I have a section that has a lot of great resources for you here. Um, I have you can click on this and you can see some past webinars I've done. I have a sample exam you can take. I have flashcards available for you to purchase and list of classes, plus over here on the left, there's also the ACP reading list, links to all those story, or all those uh, reading list items, um, and the link to any blog posts that I have, which are several of them. Um, all right, well, let's see, I have a question here from Samir, and it says, so in Kanban, your speed is limited to your slowest column. Absolutely correct. Um, and what's really interesting is, that doesn't, you already are already limited to that. But what you're doing is you're slowing the rest of this, the system down so that it is working at the same speed as your lowest column, your slowest column. Does that make sense? You, because, you, because you're working on a pull system and you can only move one, I'm moving my hands to show you this. I can't see my hands, but <laughs> you're moving one thing at a time as a hole opens up. Your, your cadence is based on your slowest column. And what happens then is the, it slows everyone down 
and reduces your inventory of, of stuff, right? So you're work, working on a number of requirements, and what happens, but the reason that you like to do that is it, it uh, slows down or it shortens up the, the total through, you know, the total cycle time um, for a story to get through the system. So if, if I make a new request and it goes to the top of the pile, and there's no big old you know, piles of, of bottleneck, right? It's all going at the same speed as the slowest. Then that new request is going to flow very smoothly through the system, right? And it'll go through, say it goes through in, in 20 days, where if I have a big pile of, of backed up requirements, right, that are like say they're going into testing from development, um, that story is going to get put into that pile, that feature is going to put into that pile, and it's going to wait until all the rest of the stuff in that pile is, is worked through, and then it's finally going to get done. And so that might be three months because you've got this huge um, bottleneck in front of testing, for example. Um, so say your testing is your bottleneck. Hey, I just did. <laughs> when you move your BAs to testing, for that Kanban team. Um, sometimes we'll move move the BAs to testing to do that. Um, it, it's helpful sometimes to do that. Um, sometimes you'll just you know throttle things back so that you don't have so much. Often what happens is testing is the bottleneck, and one of the first things we do to help that is move testing up in the system so that when when you are defining your requirements, the very next column is defining your acceptance tests. So nothing goes to your developers without a written acceptance test. Maybe it's just a table, but for every field that you have, you have an acceptance test written for it. That way, your developers, oh my gosh, actually know what they're developing to, right? They're not going to get this surprise, and there's not an animosity then between, or this kind of, I'm going to get you kind of sense between the development team and the testing team, right? Oftentimes you'll find this, this attitude that testers, you know, for, from the development side, that, you know, those testers, they're just out to get us. They're trying to trick us. And if you move it up so that all of those requirements or all, all those, those acceptance tests are defined before it goes into development, developers know exactly what you're going to test. And so, it, and that, that also helps when you start automating tests because then you, you have your automation that you build as they're doing development. But if you're not doing automation, it still is very useful to do. So that's one of the ways that you would um, increase the speed of doing your testing. And it may be your BAs that help write those, um, those acceptance test criteria or those, you know, those, those fields. Let's see. Uh, some questions here about the PMI ACP. Which ones are out there, and how do you decide which certification to go for? Yeah, um, so I actually wrote an article for Tech Target, and let's see if I can find it. I bet. around here somewhere. Um, I wrote an article for Tech Target. There it is. A cert is born is the title of the article. And at the end of that article, I talk about the different uh, certifications that are available. And they have a lovely ad here that's going to play. Skip this. I want to show it. You. So go ahead and, and, and look at this article. And down at the bottom of it is a table here that talks about the Scrum Master certifications. There's two different kinds of Scrum Master certifications out there. There's the one from Scrum Alliance, and there's the ones from um, Scrum.org. Scrum.org is Ken Schwaber's organization. Scrum Alliance is the Scrum Alliance. Um, I won't go into the details of why there's two organizations, but suffice it to say there's two. And Really, the, Scrum is the one biggest certification out there. There's IC Agile, and there's DSDM, and there's several other minor ones. 
Um, and I, you know, I hate to call them minor because the people who work on them don't, you know, they are working hard on them. But really, they're they're not the big ones. They're not the ones that everyone is looking at and and requesting on job, you know, job interviews and job postings. Um, so, if you are working with an organization, I say it in this, you know, in this article, if you're working with an organization that is only doing Scrum, and you anticipate always just working in an organization that that's doing Scrum, go down the Scrum road. Really, I mean, it's it's a great certification. If, on the other hand, you are looking at organizations that you know enterprise type organizations where Scrum doesn't always work, or you're looking at um, I don't know organizations that are trying to implement or implement Agile and are being creative or are actually being progressive in their approach to it. Um, you'll want to look at the the PMI ACP. The like you see on this on this chart. Um, the CSM doesn't require any experience, neither does the Scrum Master PSM, Professional Scrum Master 2, 1 and 2. Um, those, um, the Scrum Master CSM is really an interesting animal because um, so many organizations ask for a certified Scrum Master, and yet all you have to do to get the CSM is take a two-day class. And Take and, and take a no-fail test. Some of the better um, certified Scrum trainers, CSTs, the people who actually give the Scrum classes, will have a pass-fail, and they'll actually set a, pa a failing criteria. But according to um, the Scrum Alliance, and according to well, no, according to the Scrum Alliance, you do not fail that test. There's no fail. And the point of the CSM is not to certify that people know Scrum or are experienced with Scrum. It's to say, learn Scrum and, and spread the word about Scrum. So to that end, even the test is just one more way that they want to spread the word about Scrum, right? So they're, they don't want you to have a failure on it, so they want to give you the option. Uh, they want to give you the ability to pass it at, at all, all chances. So, but, but it's still a good certification. Don't get me wrong. If 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 I was just getting started in Agile and didn't have any experience at all, yeah, I'm going to go for the CSM because all I have to do is take a class. Um, if you have the 2,000 hours, personally, I would go for the CSP. Um, and I don't say that just because I teach the classes and I happen to be the co-chair of the PMI content support team for the ACP test, but um, <laughs> it sounds biased, but, but really, I, I would go for the ACP because of the breadth. I mean, the reason I am working with PMI and in those positions is because I do believe in it, not the other way around. Um, it, it really is a, a, a test that tests you in a breadth of approaches, right? It, it tests you not only in Scrum, but also in Kanban, XP, DSDM, and, and Lean. So you really have have to know more technologies, uh, approaches, to Agile in order to pass the uh, ACP test than you do to pass the Scrum test. The Scrum CSP test is the, you know, sort of an equivalent to, um, CSP is equivalent to the ACP, but it only covers Scrum. You don't have to know about Kanban, don't have to know about XP, don't have to know about Lean, just just Scrum. And I think that's limiting. You know, I think that's that's short-sighted. But don't don't get me wrong. I think it's a great certification if your organization is just Scrum. And I know organizations that are like Scrum by the book. This is what we do. You know, um, I've talked to them before, and, and that's they just do Scrum, which is great. So that's my two cents. I would go for the ACP if you've got the hours to get it done. Um, go for the CSM if you are just getting started in Agile. Um, probably would, you know, as a, as a process, I would go CSM, get some experience, and take an ACP class, like maybe from me, <laughs> um, in order to, uh, to get, because you have to have 2,000 hours, um, and you have to have 21 hours of, training. So that's 
for the ACP test. If you go to the, my website, I have several resources on that on that uh, uh, study central that that page that I showed you. Okay, let me see. I have one more question here. So if you say testing is safe, testing is your money. Like, oh, I already answered that one. So let's see. Um, I think that answered them. You're welcome, Cindy. Um, any other questions before we call it a day? Doesn't look like it. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining. Please, uh, again, go check out the resources that I have for you there on whitewaterprojects.com. If I'm coming to your area, I would love to see you. Um, come take one of my classes or hear me at one of my talks. And If not, I will see you next month. And uh, again, well, I apologize for moving this one on you to uh, Tuesday, but I have a, had a client meeting that I'm going to be at on Wednesday. So I will talk with you all next month. Thanks. Bye-bye.